podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I want to share with you a few thoughts on the implications of the LHC results uh, for theory. So the most important thing by far is the discovery of the Higgs particle at 125 GeV. Uh, this is a triumph for theoretical thinking. Uh, after 48 years, uh, we finally have it. Uh, the mass is particularly interesting in a variety of contexts, and much of my talk will be dealing with the possible significance of this mass in various theories. The second lesson we learned from LHC is humility. To give a measure of that, let us start with the 1980s version of the expectations for supersymmetric particles. So back then, uh, because supersymmetry was designed to solve the hierarchy problem, most of the superpartners were below the Z mass and were thought to be below the Z-mass, and uh, color superpartners were all below a TV, and that was the best expectation. As of this year, thanks to LEP and LHC, the situation has drastically changed. Most, of the super, most if not all, of the supersymmetric particles have moved above the Z-mass, and uh, the colored ones, uh, with m few exceptions, have moved up above the TeV scale. So the supersymmetric particles have been marching towards uh, and above uh, one TeV, and therefore the connection between supersymmetry and its original motivation, the hierarchy problem, has been getting diminished uh, over time. So it's fair to ask, in view of this, why haven't we given up on supersymmetry? And one reason for this, in, in my view now, the most important reason for this is uh, the supersymmetric unification. The well-known fact that uh, the three couplings meet to high precision in the supersymmetric standard model and fail to meet by m many standard deviations in the standard uh, model. If the situation was reversed, in other words, if today the standard model extrapolated to high energies agreed with gauge coupling unification, the measured values of the gauge couplings, to the same degree that supersymmetry, the supersymmetric standard model agrees, uh, many people, at least myself, I would have given up on the idea of supersymmetry and taken the standard model to be the theory until uh, some high energy. So this, to me, remains the one practical, pragmatic reason for insisting on supersymmetry and continuing to be uh, optimistic going into LHC 14. Now, supersymmetric unification can also be predicted in other well-motivated theories, such as split supersymmetry, which uses a different philosophy. It uses the multiverse philosophy. So we find ourselves at a crossroad on the right is the straight and narrow path of uh, naturalness, which uh, leads to a variety of theories, in particular supersymmetry, low energy supersymmetry. On the left lies the less traveled path of the multiverse, which can lead to the standard model or to split supersymmetry. And uh, LHC will, may give us an indication about which direction nature, nature chooses. So today I'm going to talk about the implications of the LHC data so far, first for the standard model, then the supersymmetric standard model, a theory of naturalness, and finally split supersymmetry, a theory based on the landscape. <clears throat> Let me begin with the implications of the Higgs mass uh, in the context of the standard model. So here is a plot of the quartic coupling of the Higgs as a function of energy. You see that the quartic coupling of the Higgs starts at some relatively small value of uh, 0.1 or so, and then when extrapolated to high energies, approaches zero. In fact, within the uh, experimental uncertainties, it's consistent to being zero around some high scale, gut scale or, or so. In any case, it is slightly negative. Uh, the, the, its best fit is slightly negative and of the order of 1% in magnitude. 
So the quartic coupling starts out small and gets even smaller at high scales. So this poses a bit of a puzzle. This has been the origin of many theoretical speculations that I'm not going to, to enter. Uh, but it poses puzzles. It looks like the Higgs uh, hates potentials. There are already two terms in the potential of the Higgs that we know, the mass square and the quartic coupling, and both of them uh, turn out to be small. The mass square of the Higgs is exceedingly small, and the quartic is quite small. Uh, this led to speculations about either the possibility that the Higgs is a pseudo-Goldstone, or perhaps that it is evidence for high-scale uh, supersymmetry. Another uh, related puzzle associated with 125 GeV Higgs in the standard model is uh, summarized by these plots. So this is the top mass as, uh, 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 and the Higgs mass. So the green island here, this big green island, is the, uh, the uh, green island is the island of stability. This is the island where the Higgs potential is stable and leads to a stable universe. Yellow is the island of metastability. This is where the top quark and the quartic coupling are such that the universe is metastable, but its lifetime is longer than the age of the universe. Finally, this upper red region is the region of instability, where uh, the universe would be unstable with short lifetime. And, and here is non-perturbative regime. So when, uh, so when you look at this, at this map, it looks odd. It looks like we had plenty of opportunity to live safely inside this stable island, yet the parameters of the theory are such that we live dangerously in this transitional region between instability and stability. Again, people have speculated about possible significance of this anthropic and otherwise, and I'm not going to enter into that. If you blow up this region, this is a, a significant blow up of this area. You see the same fact. But now, in terms of the bare parameters of the theory, the bare you covered, uh, and the bare quartic, and the bare top you covered. And uh, you see the same phenomenon. In this highly dim small uh, diminished scale, you see the same uh, statement that the quartic coupling of the Higgs is consistent with zero, and it's definitely very small of order of a percent. And as I was saying before, this led to speculations, perhaps for high scale supersymmetry. Supersymmetry that is broken essentially at the Planck scale or the grand unification scale, where the quartic term in, 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 in such theory is naturally small. That's the supersymmetric value of, of, of uh, the, the Higgs quartic. And uh, <coughs> uh, such a quartic, when extrapolated to low energies, would be roughly consistent with the Higgs mass. When extrapolated to low energy with the standard model particle contact. Okay. Now, <coughs> Now I'm going to uh, start uh, talking about theories beyond the standard model. This is all I wanted to say about the standard model. It's in, it's in great shape. The last ingredient of it has been discovered. So now I'm going to co consider theories of naturalness. In doing so, I will follow the lead of Samuel Beckett, who said that he would wait until it was black night before he would give up on naturalness, and insist that in spite of the absence of evidence for supersymmetry at the LHC, it will be found in the near future. OK, so let us now uh, study the consequences of 125 GeV Higgs for the supersymmetric standard model. If we take the minimal version of the supersymmetric standard model, the one that has no extra particles other than the superpartners of ordinary particles, uh, then uh, the Higgs mass, the natural value of the Higgs mass is the Z mass. And that was one of the reasons why in the 80s that was felt to be the natural scale of the theory. Now, uh, loop corrections coming in particular from the stop quark, which couples strongly to the Higgs, can modify this prediction. And if the heavy stop is sufficiently heavy, the theory breaks supersymmetry by enough so that the three-level prediction to the Higgs mass can be modified, uh, the supersymmetric prediction to the Higgs mass can be modified, and the Higgs can get uh, a mass that is consistent with 125 GeV. However, that happens at the expense of a very heavy stop quark, 
and uh, implies that the theory is tuned to about 1% or worse. If we want to maintain the, the 125 GeV Higgs mass uh, without having any tuning in the theory, not even a 1% tuning, then we need to increase the particle content. And it's fairly easy to do that. All you need to do is add a singlet in the supersymmetric standard model or a new U1 uh, gauge field. Uh, and uh, either one of these possibilities changes the tree level relation for the Higgs mass and uh, can increase it with less than per, with uh, uh, no more than 10 percent tuning to, to 125 GV. So already in the context of supersymmetry, 125 GV implies that you're most likely beyond the minimal supersymmetric standard model if supersymmetry is there at all. This is probably the most embarrassing and depressing transparency of the whole talk. These are results uh, from uh, uh, from the LHC on limits on the squark masses versus the gluino mass. This orange area is the area that has been excluded by one inverse femtobahn worth of data, and the red line is of the uh, five inverse femtobahns. And uh, you see that there has been a big chunk of parameter space that has been eliminated uh, from uh, low energy supersymmetry. However, and there is a, a lot of qualifications to this graph, this graph is made under the absolutely minimal assumptions that all supersymmetric scalars are degenerate at the grand unification scale and all supersymmetric uh, gauge particles are degenerate at the grand unification scale. Uh, in particular, it makes the assumption that the first two generation quarks are degenerate with the third generation uh, squarks. This turns out to be a very restrictive assumption for the reasons I'll explain to you. In particular, uh, the, uh, because the, third genera the first generation squarks, the up squarks and the down squarks, can be produced at the LHC through collisions of valence quarks, the cross sections for, this, uh, for, the produ for their production is large. If it so happened that the first two generation quarks were significantly heavier than that of the third generation, these limits would be very significantly relaxed, and I'll show you what they become later on. So that's one assumption, uh, and that's the most important assumption. This is the usual assumption that uh, in, in, is referred to as universality, universality of scalar masses. So universality, theories with universal squark masses at the unification scale are highly constrained, and you can see this, uh, they are roughly, we are marching towards the one and a half to two TV region, either in, in, in squarks or in, in, in gluinos. <coughs> now, the natural supersymmetry relaxes the assumption of universality of all scalar masses by making the following observation. This, these theories were actually motivated from the supersymmetric flavor problem. And uh, the, uh, the motivation was that because the flavor problem has to do with the light generations, first and second generation, uh, the, it can be solved if the first and second generation quarks are heavy very heavy, maybe 10 TeV. And, and that, the key observation was that that does not uh, worsen the fine tuning problem or, because the top quark predominantly couples to, uh, the, the Higgs predominantly couples to the top quark, to third generation quarks. So as long as they are light, the hierarchy problem is not destabilized. So the basic observation, the, the basic proposal basis, therefore, was to keep the bare minimum of ingredients light in the supersymmetric standard model. And uh, this includes the Higgsinos that directly, uh, in, uh, that directly, uh, whose mass is directly related to the Higgs mass. The stops that have a large quartic coupling uh, to the Higgs. And the gluinos that affect the stop mass through a loop, which in turn affects the Higgs mass. Okay. Therefore, if you just have a theory with uh, a relatively light Higgsinos below a TV, uh, stops and gluinos, that theory 
uh, could be by itself natural, even if the other super partners were far bigger than one TV. And that, as I said, would also address the, the flavor problem. In the context of such a theory, you can have less than 10% tuning as long as the Higgs xenon masses are uh, less than 250, the stops less than 600, and the Guinness less than 1.4 TV. Okay, relatively accessible number right now. So if you remake some of the plots of the limits implied in supersymmetric theories with such a spectrum, you find the following. And these are, this is, uh, there are two plots here. The left one is the vertical axis is the, is the, max, uh, the mass of the lightest supersymmetric particle, and the horizontal axis is the, the lightest stop quark mass. Okay. Now, uh, the colored regions that you see here are excluded regions. Uh, you see that squarks all the way down to 500 uh, GeV are allowed in this uh, natural supersymmetry framework. In addition, there is a gap between 160 and 230 GeV that is also allowed. And uh, 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 the, the reason for this gap uh, can be understood as follows. Uh, notice the vertical axis is the mass of the lightest supersymmetric particle. That mass is very significant. As you crank up the mass of the lightest supersymmetric particle, searches for supersymmetry become harder, and the limits on other particles, such as the stops, become greatly diminished. If, in particular, you start decreasing the amount of uh, uh, missing, uh, uh, missing energy. So, for example, if the stop is near the top quark mass, uh, you, uh, uh, it is very hard to search for such a stop, both because you decrease the amount of missing energy uh, because the stop-top uh, splitting is small, and because the stop final state, the stop signatures, can be confused with top quark signatures. So this gap uh, may or may not be filled uh, within the next several months. It's a, it's a subject of uh, intense investigation uh, from the experimentalists. And uh, okay. so, so this is essentially the limits. Uh, as, uh, uh, if if uh, you see from these limits that, that if the light supersymmetric particle is above about 160 GV, these limits get further relaxed. This is a similar plot for Gluinos. Again, the mass of the lighter supersymmetric particle. Again, this mass is important because it has implications about the amount of measurable missing energy. And, and, and the horizontal axis is the, is the, is the Gluino mass. Uh, the, 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 red, the region outside, above and to the right of this red line, is, uh, is, uh, is allowed from all data. The region inside is forbidden. So you see. Gluino masses above a TV are still allowed. If the lighter supersymmetric particle is about 500, for, for, over 450 GV, then the bounds get further relaxed and the Gluino could even be light. However, lighter supersymmetric particle above 500 GV would mean that the other superpartners are even heavier, and, uh, it, and it, it is questionable whether such a theory would be naturalness, unless everybody was crushed near 600 GV, which is hard to believe. So these are the, uh, uh, the first things that will be done in the next several months. Filling this stop gap would be important, and extending the stop work mass limits and extending the Gluino limits. Now, extending the Gluino limits is extremely important. The Gluino turns out to be one of the most important particles for naturalness. And this is for two reasons. First, experimental. Experimentally, the Gluino is the most abundantly produced color particle because it has a big color. So uh, the second is theoretical. The theoretical reason has to do with the fact that Gluino tends to attract or pull up the spectrum of lighter supersymmetric particles. Uh, for in particular, the three key players in the game of naturalness, namely the Higgs, the Stop, and the Gluino, are all interconnected with each other by renormalization group running, uh, by loop corrections and also by, 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 the, uh, by the running. 
So for example, uh, here is a plot of various mass ratio, Gluina to stop, stop to Higgs, Gluina to Higgs, as a function of the logarithm of, uh, of the scale of the messenger scale divided by the superpartner scale. Okay? So even if you have one order of magnitude, uh, even if you have one order of magnitude of difference of running between the, the, the superpartner masses and the, uh, and the messenger ma masses, the Gluino uh, pulls up the stop to within about a factor of two of itself. If you have three orders of magnitude of running, the Gluino pulls up the stop to almost uh, the point of degeneracy. And of course, once the Gluino pulls up the stop, the stop pulls up the Higgs and the Higgs, uh, uh, the, the stop pulls up the Higgs. And uh, uh, so that's the implied pull. So you see, even for three orders of magnitude of running, you have a factor of about uh, oh, three and a half ratio for Gluino to. So if you are able to limit the Gluino uh, mass to about to over one and a half TV, you start having, uh, uh, well, two things. First, the theory starts becoming tuned automatically. Even if you don't measure the stop work mass, if you measure a very heavy Gluino mass, say two TV or above, that is already evidence for tuning. Uh, especially, and it's also a big theoretical uh, uh, constraint on theories. It suggests very low scale mediation theories where these uh, effects of the Gluino pool are, are minimized. So here is a possible natural spectrum that is not uh, uh, yet, uh, that seems to be consistent with data, even today's data. Uh, uh, this, again, this is not based on a model, although we think it's very simple to construct such models. Uh, in fact, you can, anyway, it's easy to write such models. So uh, the first and second generation's particles are very heavy, let's say way above one TV. Uh, the Gluino is around one TV. Stops, bottoms, uh, the, the, both, the stops and bottoms are between 200 and 500, the electroequinos here, and the Gravitino is uh, very light. Okay, that's the true LSP. The next to light, a supersymmetric particle, is the stop, and, uh, and everything else is heavier. So here, if you produce superparticles, they'll all cascade down rapidly to the stop, which will subsequently decay to the gravitino in a top. And if the stop mass is near the top mass, that is a difficult signature. That's what many experimentalists are focusing. This is the mass gap, the top gap region between uh, 250, uh, uh, b between uh, around 200 GeV. Okay, such theories, again, if you want to preserve natural, it should have one new ingredient, perhaps just a singlet, perhaps a new, uh, a new gauge force, a new U1. And in order to minimize the effects of the Gluino running that I was referring to before, uh, it requires uh, low scale supersymmetry breaking. So it's possible, uh, you, you can easily write down effective theories based with, consistent with minimal flavor violation that gives you such a spectrum. And uh, at the moment, this is like, this spectrum would qualify as saying, nothing today, everything tomorrow. So this is a very optimistic uh, spectrum. I don't suggest that this is what will happen, but this is how tight things are. So here is again a summary of what we expect uh, in, a, in a very optimistic rosy picture. We'll fill this pink uh, region in our searches. Perhaps the stop gap, perhaps extend the stop search above a TV by December. Maybe it will take longer for the actual analysis over the next couple of years. Uh, uh, so some of these regions should be filled. Also, the Gluino mass should be probed somewhere between one and a half to 1.8 TV. And this you can, uh, you can extrapolate as follows. At seven TV with five inverse femtobarns, the, 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 the limit to the Gluino mass was about one. If you go to eight TV and, and you run with 10 inverse femtobarns, you can limit the Gluino mass to 1.4. That's about where we are now. And if you accumulate by the end of December 20 or 30 inverse femtobarns, you should start approaching 2 TV. I'm not sure how close to 2 uh, we will get. Uh, stop, as I said before. So natural supersymmetry 
can be tested uh, and uh, hopefully will be to, uh, tested until uh, the end of, of this year. Now, what this means, of course, is uh, means that the theory is not tuned to more than, whether the theory is or is not tuned to more than 1% will be known. So if something is discovered here, it will be a sigh of relief for naturalness. If not, it will just suggest tuning worse than a percent. It may not be. Okay. So now I'll turn to the other path, the multiverse path. And in doing so, again, I will not follow this time the uh, advice of Samuel Beckett, who didn't care, who cared only about the worms and did not care about the grand picture of, of, of the landscapes. So I will contemplate possibility of theories based on, on the multiverse. And uh, one such theory is split supersymmetry. As uh, is well known, split supersymmetry has scalar superpartners above 10 TeV. Uh, the gluinos are around the TV, in the TV regime. Uh, el Electroweekinos and, and the tuned Higgs are in the TV to 100 GeV uh, regime. So this was, uh, 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 this theory was motivated from the landscape. It addresses immediately flavor and CP problems because the scalar superpartners, which are the main players in flavor changing neutral currents and CP violation, are automatically heavy, and it preserves the successes of the uh, gauge coupling unification uh, and also the possibility of calculable dark matter around uh, a TV. <coughs> unification works uh, about the same way as uh, unification works in, in uh, ordinary supersymmetric theories. Here you see, for example, if the scalar uh, these are the scalar masses, and this is the value of alpha strong. This is one sigma uh, error in alpha strong. So if the scalar masses are anywhere between oh, 10 TV and uh, uh, 10 to the 10 GeV, uh, unification works, depending on the mass of the electroweekinos. Unification works very well. It's not really different than low energy supersymmetry. And the reason, of course, is that the particles, the particles that have been made heavy in split supersymmetry, namely the, the, the squarks and the slepons, are complete SU5 families and do not discriminate SU3, SU2, and U1. OK. <clears throat> Here is a very important plot. Uh, this is what we have learned uh, about split supersymmetry from the 125 GeV Higgs. The vertical axis is the mass of the Higgs, and the horizontal axis is the scale of supersymmetry breaking. And by that, what I mean is the mass of the scalars, the squarks uh, in particular, uh, that uh, in split supersymmetry are in principle allowed to be anywhere from 10 TeV to the grand unification scale. Focus on this uh, pink or orange band here. Uh, this is the prediction for the Higgs mass. This band is the prediction for the Higgs mass in split supersymmetry theories. Uh, do not pay attention to this blue band, which is on a, for a somewhat different theory. Okay? So, th so this is uh, uh, the, the prediction. The reason for the existence of this band is that the prediction depends on what linear combination of the two supersymmetric Higgses the light Higgs is. The prediction, this width corresponds to the uncertainty in what's called tangent beta, uh, the mixing between two Higgses that gives you the light Higgs. So you see this green line here is the experimentally favored region from the Higgs mass, 125 GeV. So you see in split supersymmetry, the value of the Higgs mass can be reproduced if the scale of supersymmetry breaking is anywhere from 10 TeV here to about uh, 10 to the 4 TeV here. 
So it selects this, uh, this, this band of masses for the scalars, for the scale of supersymmetry breaking. Now, if fermions are going to be good dark matter candidates, they should also be at around the TeV. So this type of theory, the, the, this new information that the Higgs has provided us, uh, uh, favors theories where the fermions are separated from scalars by one, one or two loop uh, corrections. Okay? So if, if, the, if, the, if the scalars are somewhere here, to, well, that would be nice, it would also solve the flavor problem if they're about 1,000 TeV, then one or two loop uh, separated fermions, uh, uh, lighter fermions, would, uh, 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 would be consistent both with dark matter and with flavor constraints and with the Higgs mass. So these theories, these theories are called mini-split theories. Uh, they became popular since the December 14th announcement of, of the Higgs. Uh, a possible mechanism, a very nice mechanism for doing that is anomaly mediation. I decided not to talk about it uh, because I thought Nima would talk about it, but he decided to talk about something else. So I will not talk about anomaly mediation, which is fairly well known uh, since 2004. And uh, uh, so I will instead talk about a somewhat different way of having fermion to scalar mass ratios to be related by powers of alpha. So this is an extremely simple theory, uh, a sim simple way to get a mini split spectrum. Imagine that you have a new U1. For example, this could be the U1 of B barrier number minus lepton number, U1 of B minus L, to <coughs> that occurs naturally in, in grand unified theories. And uh, imagine that you do gauge mediation through the, 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 the Z boson of this new U1. Uh, this new U1 is carried by the scalar particles, like the squarks and the sleptons. So the squarks and the sleptons get a two-loop mass mediated by this U1. But the normal gauginos, because they don't carry this U1 quantum number, only get their mass through, the, uh, through coupling to the scalars. So the Gigino masses are at three loops. So scalar masses squared are two loops, which means scalar masses roughly are one loop. So the ratio between uh, uh, Gigino and scalar masses are, is a two loop uh, factor. Okay. So in this theory, you can naturally get Gigino to scalar mass ratios of order of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, and uh, uh, no, no bigger than 10 to the 4 if, if you have perturbative, 10 to the 4 or so if you have perturbative couplings. So this is a, a simple way to get hierarchy. You also get universal masses for squarks, which is, you know, doubly protects you from flavor changing neutral currents. So the, the statement that Gagino and scalar masses are, this ratio is fixed, it can be pictorially represented here. So Gaginos are here, scalars are here, they're separated by, by this two loop factor. Now, Experimental bounds, for example, coming from the LHC, push the Gagino mass to about several hundred GeV or one TeV or so from the left. The Higgs mass, the Higgs mass prediction in split supersymmetry pushes the scalars to be lighter than about 10 to the 7 GeV. So in this theory, you, because the, the hierarchy is predicted to be about 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5, you essentially, the, uh, the, 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 the gauginos and the scalars fill this allowed range of, uh, of uh, the less allowed master, and scalars are forced to be under 10 to the 7, and, uh, and gauginos are forced to be above a TV. This essentially fixes the scalars and the gauginos to be in these two ex extreme ends. The theory to have to be on the right side of this band, where there is no flavor problem, and the right side of this band is, corresponds to a tangent beta of one, which means that the light Higgs is an equal combination of the two uh, high energy Higgses. So, uh, in particular, because the scalars cannot be any heavier than 10 to the 7, and the gauginos are two loop related to the scalars, the, uh, the scalars, 
the gay genomes are expected to be LHC accessible. So this is an example of a theory, of a mini split theory, other than anomaly mediation. And uh, it's, uh, uh, this, uh, these are somewhat more details about the spectrum of, of, of this theory. So the U1 uh, that we are studying in general can be a, a combination of B minus L and hypercharge. That's one example that commutes that uh, of a U1 that commutes with generations. So all generations have the same U1 assignments and, uh, and uh, is gotten easily from grand unified theories. So the spectrum uh, is about uh, 10 to 40 V scalar particles and uh, around the TV the rest uh, of the particles. And as I said, the fermions, given them that this is an upper limit to the scalar superpartner masses, the fermions should be LHC accessible. The light is supersymmetric particle in this uh, theory, uh, <coughs> excuse me, turns out to be the Bino. Okay. Now, the spectrum of this theory. So now, uh, this theory is completely determined by this parameter theta. And, uh, and the overall mass scales that I indicated uh, are constrained by experiment. So here is the vertical axis is the, the mass squared of the scalars in this theory as a function of theta, where theta again is the mixing angle between B minus L and hypercharge that determines the low energy U1. So here is zero. This black line here is zero. You see, for a vast uh, amount of space, uh, the theory produces tachyons, negative mass squared particles, uh, stops, etc. That obviously would be a disaster. It would uh, break color. It would be unstable. So uh, this turns out to be a very generic feature of split supersymmetry models that has not been uh, uh, well has not been emphasized too much. Uh, and it comes about as follows, a very general phenomenon. In split supersymmetry theories, the scalars, uh, the, the genus are very light and the scalars are heavy. Now, from renormalization group running, scalar masses tend to get negative as a result of Yukawa interactions. And they tend to get, they tend to get smaller as a result of Yukawa interactions and bigger as a result of Geigino interactions. But because the genomes are so light, they don't anymore affect the scalar mass square running. Uh, in, so in split supersymmetry where the genomes are very light, uh, scalars have a big danger of getting negative masses squared. This is true in all split theories, but it's in particular true in this model. So, and it's tremendously constrained to give you, so essentially you exclude all parameter space that has tachyonic stops, for example, etc. And this is the only region of the, of the mixing angle theta that is allowed by experiment. Now, th this is interesting. The U1 that corresponds to this band of thetas is what is normally called the high scale B minus L. Okay, it's, it's, uh, uh, the, 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 the B minus L that naturally occurs in SO10 grand unification when you break it down to SU5 cross U1. That U1 B minus L is what, what is preferred by these theories. And the rest is excluded by negative mass squared. Here is the gay genome mass spectrum. Again, you see Binos, Winos, Gluinos, Higginos. And similarly, once you restrict yourself to the regions which don't have tachyonic stops, you get, uh, uh, you get this spectrum. <clears throat> OK. What are the experimental implications of these uh, theories? First, the, the most important, the most uh, distinctive experimental implication of split supersymmetry theories is long-lived Gulinos at the Large Hadron Collider. So, here is a plot of the lifetime of the Gulino as a function of the supersymmetry breaking scale, the scalar masses. Now, uh, the supersymmetry breaking scale, the scalar masses are constrained by the Higgs mass now to be between 10 to the 4 GeV and 10 to the 7 GeV. So the lifetimes, the, the, the allowed range for the masses is here. Uh, 
the, and here you see the lifetime for various mass gluinos. Here is half a TV gluino. The red is one TV, etc. Two TV, the green, etc. So you see that for uh, ma many gluino masses, the decays of the of the gluinos can be either prompt. Ah, I should say something. The lifetime. Uh, there are three types of lifetime for the gluinos. Prompt gluinos are those that de that decay instantaneously. Displaced gluinos have slightly longer lifetime, so they create, um, they, they, they move for a small distance, like a centimeter or so, and then they decay. Some ma macroscopic distance, and then they decay. And long lived is gluinos that decay after they move throughout the whole detector, 30 meters or so, and then they decay. So, in the mass range of scalars that is picked out from the Higgs mass, uh, you have all three possibilities depending on the gluino mass uh, and, the, and the scalar masses. For light scalar masses, the decays of the gluinos are prompt. For intermediate scalar masses, they are displaced. And uh, for uh, ev eventually, you can get uh, uh, collider stable gluinos on the high range of, of the scalar masses. So that, that is perhaps the most important signature. There have been searches. Uh, split is a popular theory even upon, among experimentalists. So uh, the, no, nowadays, it's the second thing they look for after natural supersymmetry. Uh, so there, they have already bounds on. Uh, this is one bound. I, I showed something like this similar before. So the, the limit. So the limit on the gluino mass as a function of the mass of the lightest supersymmetry particle. Again, the gluino mass is uh, constrained to be about a TV or above for either prompt or slightly displaced gluinos. At the moment, they don't tell the difference. Uh, so here is, uh, and again, as before, if the LSP mass is above 350 GV, the gluino can be lighter. So this is an atlas search. There is a CMS. There are CMS and atlas searches for both of these things. Here is a CMS search for collider-stable gluinos. These are gluinos that are produced and travel um, more than the detector length the, the, before they decay. So they create punch-through type signatures. So this is the uh, the limit that you're supposed to read off from here is that the gluino mass. Uh, for collider stable gluinos is more than about a TV. These other lines that you see, this is the corresponding limit for collider stable stop. So it has to be more than 600 GV. And this is collider stable staus. They have to be more than 450 GV or so. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the most uh, Optimistic case for split is if the gluino is less than a 3, t 3 TeV or so, then it should be produced and seen with, with characteristic uh, decays. And electrowinos are, are also accessible at the LHC, especially in this U1 prime framework that I presented, where the gageino to scalar masses are two loop related. A very popular topic uh, since at least last October, is uh, what can the Higgs tell us about the uh, dichotomy between naturalness and the multiverse? And the point continues to be the same. It has not yet been clarified uh, experimentally, is that a natural Higgs is not the standard model Higgs. In other words, any uh, solutions to the naturalness problem involve some new physics canceling the quadratic divergences to the Higgs mass. And the very same processes that do that when attached with gluons or with photons uh, contribute to the production of the Higgs and also to the decay of the Higgs. So the production of the Higgs through gluons and the decay of the Higgs through photons uh, uh, is also mediated by the same new physics processes. So if there is light new physics around 100 GV, where, uh, which solves the hierarchy problem, it is bound to influence the properties of the Higgs. And starting in December and continuing until July 4th of this year, 
uh, including July 4th of this year, there have been some very preliminary hints of a possible deviation of the Higgs properties from those of the standard model Higgs. And that has to do with the, uh, uh, with, with the uh, production of the Higgs through the gamma-gamma channel, uh, uh, production of the Higgs and its decay through the gamma-gamma channel, which seems to be within big error bars, within two, two sigma or so, uh, higher than the standard model cross-section by a factor of one and a half or so. It's very preliminary, but it is something that experimentalists are focusing on and will try to clarify as much as possible until December and, of, and of course, after the 2000 and after the 14 TV run. So this is one of the most, one of the hopes that we have for seeing evidence for beyond the standard model physics through the Higgs. So conclusions of what we have learned in the last couple of years uh, from the LHC is first that natural supersymmetry, because of the Higgs mass, requires a new ingredient, perhaps a singlet uh, or a new U1 uh, in, in the supersymmetric standard model, assuming that it is not a very tuned theory. The Gluino mass constraints that are the constraints that are coming the fastest, because the Gluino is such an easy particle to produce, uh, push natural supersymmetry to the corner and will continue to do so uh, in the next few months of this year. LHC may exclude natural supersymmetry by 2012. Again, by natural supersymmetry, I mean things not being tuned more than, worse than a percent. Split supersymmetry, Higgs point, uh, the, the, uh, the main development was that Higgs points to the theory that was called mini-split, where the scalar masses are not far above the 1 TeV scale. Maybe they are only above a factor of 1,000 or so. And uh, so uh, mini-split model building is probably going, continue going to be a, a popular topic uh, uh, among uh, phenomenological model builders. Uh, <clears throat> Higgs mass and properties will be investigated. Traditional supersymmetric scenario can account for up to 30 per I didn't have time to talk about it. I thought I didn't have time to talk about it. Traditional supersymmetric scenario, given the present constraints on supersymmetry, traditional supersymmetric scenario have a difficulty accounting for Higgs properties that deviate from those of the standard model by more than 30%. This does not mean you cannot do it. You can go to extreme levels of parameters, like uh, for the aficionado, large A terms or large mu terms and large tangent beta, where you can find effects bigger than 30%. Uh, this scenario will have to be tuned. Such large A terms will typically imply a much, uh, uh, will destabilize the hierarchy. But if you are willing to tune, you can accommodate changes in the uh, Higgs branching ratios uh, of order one. Otherwise, the constraints uh, are, uh, you cannot change the, the, the Higgs properties by more than 30% without tuning. That's what it seems, uh, just playing around. And uh, a non-standard model Higgs, of course, favors naturalness. So what's next experimentally? Well, for next year, uh, three things. First, fill the stop gap, very t difficult task that the experimentalists are working on. Second, crop gluino masses above 1.4 TeV, hopefully approach 2 TeV if possible. Third, study all the Higgs production, cross-sections, and branching ratio as much as possible, and look carefully for any anomalies, such as in Higgs to photon photon. Next five years, well, that list is more obvious. Continue studying Higgs couplings and continue to look for particles or any other evidence for physics beyond the standard model. So stay tuned. In the motivations for supersymmetry, you assisted uh, mainly to the, high, to the um, uh, unification. 
and the higher entropy. You didn't say much about the dark matter. So my question is, in the framework, for instance, on natural supersymmetry, what is the dark matter candidate? I did not hear your question. Tell me again. The question is in the framework of natural supersymmetry yes? that, uh, that you presented. Uh, what is the dark matter candidate? The normal uh, neutralinos uh, electroweakinos. So the neutralinos are also light, lighter yeah. than the stop. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, right. The first two generation colors particles are very heavy, but all of the, the third generation uh, uh, colors particles and everything else can be light. For example, here are examples of direct limits on charged particles. The best limits on charged particles are it's somewhat model dependent, but it's about 103.5 GeV. This is going back to lab for a new charged particle. Uh, so electroweakinos can easily be around 100 GeV and still be around. We have not excluded them. All, I should have clarified this, the strongest exclusions are for colored particles. So most of what I showed was gluinos and stops. I didn't show too much of the other ones. They are not as depressing, and I didn't show them. For, uh, by the way, even LHC14, the reach of LHC14, let's say for non-colored particles, will be fairly limited. For electroweakinos, it will be about 400 GeV. So uh, e even LHC14 will not set strong bounds on, on things other than the colored particles. About two years ago, there was a paper by Shoposhnikov and Wetterich uh, predicting the Higgs mass to be 126, but not on the basis of anything you've told us, but simply on the basis of an asymptotic safety uh, scenario. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, I do. I, I had looked at this. Uh, so what they, they noticed is they put the then favored value of the top mass of two to three years ago, which was 171 GeV. And then they found that the quartic coupling goes to zero for a Higgs mass of 126 GeV. The new value, the value of the top mass has now migrated from 171 GeV to 173 GeV. Given that new value, the, the value of the Higgs mass they would have predicted is now close to 130. Uh, that's one comment. Now, of course, there is error bars and, you know, up to two sigma. Yeah. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what to make of any of these things that I showed you. Uh, the fact that we live, we seem to love to live dangerously. The, the Higgs is a very weird particle. It has, you know, its quadratic term is tiny, uh, at the, and its quartic term turns out to be small. So I don't know what to make of it. People. In this plot that I showed you about metastability, the fact that we could have lived safely in a vast green island, yet we prefer to live right in the periphery of metastability. It's, uh, I, I don't know what to make any of these things. It's, it could be deep. It could be evidence, you know, people like myself will say, oh, it's probably evidence for high-scale supersymmetry. Oh, by the way, I didn't define the theory that I had labeled high-scale so, so high-scale supersymmetry is a very simple theory. You start with supersymmetry at the Planck scale or, or the grand unification scale, and uh, you imagine that it is broken there, and at that place, the values of all the couplings are given by their supersymmetric values. For example, the quartic coupling of the Higgs is proportional to you know, g squared over 8, the, the gauge couplings over 8. So it starts times cosine to beta. So it starts out smallish, and then you run it. So it could be evidence for high-scale supersymmetry with tangent beta of order 1, which you can easily get in SO10 theories. So, or it could be pseudo Golson's. I, I don't know what to make of it. They are very interesting coincidence, but the original point is no longer as attractive given the new top mass. It seems that there is some uh, amount of tension between the idea that we use supersymmetry uh, and going away from naturalness. 
So the idea of supersymmetry is partly motivated by theoretical naturalness and also the unification of couplings, which you are pointing as evidence for supersymmetries again, a consequence of naturalness. If you are willing to give up naturalness, then there are various ways of making unifications happen by putting exotics or this or that. Of course. So isn't there a dichotomy that we take a road to the left but use ideas from the right? Oh, that's only because, okay. So the question is, what you're suggesting is the following. Why not give up completely supersymmetry and start sprinkling inside the desert at random multiplets, doublets, and triplets, and then uh, eventually you'll get lucky and you'll get a, a combination of a, a spectrum in the desert that will accidentally reproduce exactly the same result that you get as a consequence of a symmetry, namely supersymmetry and grand unification. This is possible. It's possible that unification is an accident. In split supersymmetry, unification is less of an accident because it still relies on, on the supersymmetric particle content, on a particle content that is well motivated from the top down. If you put random multiplets in the desert to reproduce the same result, it would not be well motivated from, from a symmetry from the top down. So I find it less attractive, but it's possible. Well, I'm certainly not suggesting unification is accident, but I'm saying that the idea that unification of the coupling suggests that there's supersymmetry at low energy scale as a strong evidence for supersymmetry is a bit strong, uh, strongly uh, biased, I would say, towards supersymmetry. If indeed the evidence for supersymmetry at low scale begins to look fading, one would probably try to build new roads. I would imagine that we haven't probably found the correct road yet. But by new roads, you mean roads different than this dichotomy between landscape and naturalness? Yes. Some road in the middle? Yes. Yeah, I would be very interested to know. Do you have a philosophy for that? Certainly, I, I, would, I don't know, but it seems like both of these roads seem a bit, uh, a bit uh, at this point, fine-tuned. So, so, yeah, yeah a third it, road would be just fine-tuned for no reason. It appears that we are going on one road, but we are using ideas of the right road, which is a bit strange. I don't think it is strange because the idea of having supersymmetric particle content, such as occurs in split supersymmetry, can be motivated from the top down. All you need to hypothesize is that the, the, there are two symmetries at work. When you, when you determine the supersymmetric particle spectrum, there are two symmetries that have to be broken. One is supersymmetry that is related to the scalar masses eventually. And the other is uh, uh, Gagino uh, masses, are symmetry The usual hypothesis when we deal with low energy supersymmetry is that supersymmetry and R-symmetry are broken at the same scale by the same, by the same source. I think this is a very limiting assumption. If you look at the landscape of all possibilities, there is probably vastly more theories where supersymmetry and R-symmetry are broken at different scales. And uh, in such theories, having hierarchy between the scalars and the fermions of the supersymmetric standard model will be very natural. So I, I, I think having split supersymmetric spectrum is v very well motivated. And if I believed in this measure business, I'm not smart enough to talk about measures sensibly. But if I were, I, would, I could probably find reasons why the vast, vast theories in the landscape, and there are vastly more split SUSY theories in the landscape than ordinary SUSY theories, where SUSY and R has to be broken exactly at the same point. Well, I'm just uh, not sure if I, uh, is it fair to say that on both uh, forks on this road, uh, the Higgs data favor, well, disfavor the Grand Desert? On no, one side, it looks like it's some kind of a split SUSY, so there are particles at the, uh, southern TV, and another fork, there is something to, uh, to prevent us from the Higgs going bananas or something like that. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I, I cannot make such a strong statement. In fact, if it, my first, in my first transpire, oh, this is not, the, the, the road on the left, the multiverse, had two branches. One was split supersymmetry, which I like because of unification, because I feel it's well motivated from the top down. And the other is a, a standard model. I, 
I cannot say that the standard model is disfavored. Uh, the standard model all the way up to some high enough scale, I don't think it's disfavored. Uh, it's, it's just a little weird that you have to do something at some point when the quartic starts becoming negative, but that is far enough away that well, it is far enough in a, in a way, but it's not quite at the, at the Planck scale, is it? Yes, the central value is not quite at the Planck scale. The central value, as you perceptively noticed, it starts around 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 12 GeV. So uh, that's when things start becoming negative. That's okay. It could be a pretty big desert, if not necessarily, big desert, if not, not necessarily all the way to that scale. Yeah. You could have high-scale SUSY. By the way, I didn't talk about the theory of high-scale supersymmetry. Well, uh, you remember the blue bands that I had on the Higgs mass? That was exactly the theory where you take the standard model at face value, and you continue it until some mass scale M. And M can be anything from you know, 100 TV to the God scale. And you look at the predictions of, of this theory. Maybe I should show it. And, uh, for example, something like high-scale supersymmetry could manifest itself at around 10 to the 12 to make sense out of the, uh, to sort of prevent the theory from becoming uh, disastrous and, uh, you know, supplement it with supersymmetric particle content to prevent the instability. So that's possible. And you can read off. Oh. Ah. I'm sorry, this is a PDF. You can read off uh, the scale, the scales of high-scale supersymmetric theories, which gives you the right Higgs mass, is somewhere between 10 to the 12 GeV and 10 to the 4 GeV or 10 to the 5 GeV. Forget the strength of the band. Okay. So uh, I think.